and Jasmine Moody get the start in the post, and with that tip, we are underway. Oh yeah, I remember it very, very well. We'd get close, and then we'd fall back. We'd get close, and we'd fall back again, and that stuff. And they were really kind of controlling the game. He said there wasn't a lot of fans there that day, and the cheering was not what it could be. And they were fighting their way back, and I remember that uh, Gonzaga scored. And another steal, right off. Wayman's free throw, no good. Another offensive board as it goes right back to the shooter and Jeff Judkins pleading for a timeout with his team trailing by one and 139 to play. BYU looking for its first lead of the game. My name is Scott Park and I am a diehard BYU fan. For him, it is just watching the game. Even if they lose, he doesn't care. He's a huge fan of just watching them play as hard as they can. Scott sent an email to our basketball office and he described uh, he wanted to come down to a basketball game at Portland. And he said he was driving 250 mile plus miles away from Washington to come down to watch this game. So we thought anyone who can drive that far deserves tickets. So we gave him tickets. We've never met him before. And all of a sudden you hear this guy just going after the refs. Come on, it's six to one. You guys are terrible. It's home cooking. And it goes on the whole game. After the game ends, we come out of the locker room and this guy comes up to me and he says, hey, uh, great game, coach. Yeah, I was giving it to the refs the whole game. And I come to find out that guy was Scott. So it was the first time I ever met him and I knew right then and there I loved him because he was a diehard BYU fan. He learns about the players, different players. Or in this, when he learns about them, he, he it causes him to think about what sacrifices they make to do that. And they, they don't do it just for themselves. He, they do it for their fans too, is how he sees it. Getting away from the normal eight to five job the normal run-of-the-mill work that you always do and that stuff. It was a break in the schedule. You know, I would, I would probably say I, I go down now about 15, 16 times a year to watch BYU. What I remember is the day started out normal. Then Scott called me, said, have you heard from Ben or Marilyn? Ben didn't show up for work. We all tried to call Ben. He, he doesn't answer. And I knew something was wrong. I jumped in the car, went out to his trailer, you know, knocked on the door, nobody answered, I hear the dog barking on the inside, so I opened the uh, door up and there, were, yeah, and then I found Ben and Marilyn there on the bed. I got in my car and I just flew. <laughs> As I, you know, I'm pulling up, my dad's out in the street, so I park, I get out. He just, got away, hugged me, <laughs> and I knew my brother was dead. I've seen on TV where people collapse out of sorrow. I always thought, oh, they're acting, but it's not acting, because I, I just fell to the floor and cried. The fact that he and Marilyn would have ended their lives intentionally. It wasn't even crossing my mind at that moment. When we went to see the coroner, we found out she had shot him and then she shot herself. Everybody was saying it was a love-packed thing. And I'm thinking, how can you love somebody and shoot him in the head? But over time in prayer, I realized that they were both on drugs. And when you're on drugs, you don't think logically. Immediately following Ben's death, my dad was put in the hard spot of needing to coordinate the funeral, needing to worry about the trailer that they had been living in. So I just kind of went in automatic and this has got to be done. But that's all that I was doing. Very, very unlike me and my kids, my family, they knew that, they knew I wasn't. They knew that I was doing everything, but I wasn't really there. I wasn't really there. Every time he closed his eyes, he would see them dead on the bed. And so going to sleep for him for a long time was really, really hard because he didn't want to close his eyes. About uh, three or four months after we lost Ben in Maryland, uh, my wife, my brother, and my, everybody kind of kicked me out of the house. That's the way I felt. Go do something. Go get, you know, go do something for yourself because, you know, this is something you enjoy. Go do it.
As they came off during that timeout, the ladies came out and they were going like this, you know, you know. I literally asked myself the questions they were doing that. What am I doing here? I just buried my son and daughter-in-law. And that's when, like I said, Heavenly Father just took a two by four and hit me over the head with it. Scott, you're not dead. You can still affect the living. Now get up and cheer. <laughs> and I did. I literally burst into tears, just tears coming down my eyes because it was like the dam broke and all of a sudden I could, I could live again. I could actually feel again. The sadness wasn't really there. It was more of a celebration of the lives that Ben and Marilyn had had, the celebration of these young women that were out there fighting so hard for, you know, yeah, to get a win, to get the dub. I was part of it and I could be part of it. And it was like they were inviting me. When they said, come on, you know, they were inviting me to be part of that uh, happiness and that joy. Um, and that's what I felt. Right, Alch has the ball and the dogs are called off by Lisa Fortier. BYU wins 58-54. What a game between... Dear Coach Judkins, please share this with your team. They mean the world to me. You'll find out why as you read this. We were all asked to individually read this letter. So when it became my time, I looked at the front of it and it said Scott Park. And I was like, oh, it's a letter from Scott. Didn't think anything of it. As I started reading the letter, you know, Scott just started to... Ah! Scott just started to uh, thank us. As I reflect on this experience, your team provided me one of those tender mercies from Heavenly Father that I desperately needed. They may never know how they are affecting people, but the sacrifice so much of their time and energy on our behalf, well, again, thank you. We loved him before that letter, but after that, he became uh, the Godfather. It's okay if you feel angry, it really is okay. It's okay if you feel sad. It's okay when you get depressed, it's really okay. That's part of being alive and living is having those feelings. The one word of advice though is let other people into your lives and let them help you. Don't be so proud or so embarrassed that you won't let other people help you and love you. They're just basically doing what our Father in Heaven wants them to do is by loving you, caring for you, watching out for you, and taking care of you as well. People always say uh, people are going through things that we never know what they're going through. That's why a kind act, a smile, a letter, a phone call uh, can go a long way. And to know that our kind deed helps someone or basically save a life, that's what we're all here for. We're here to uh, help people progress. and. We felt like we did our part that day. And we can't take full credit for it because, like Scott said, it was a tender mercy. We were just listening to the prompting.